And the issue from the standpoint of justice and retribution is how can you let that individual off the hook? She wasn't murdered. She was slaughtered. That's one side of the justice coin. I want to give you the other side. I defended, rightly or wrongly, the defendant. I had him brought across state lines from Colorado to Los Angeles where we brain scanned him in the same scanner that we scanned the 41 individuals. This is an average scan of 41, uh, sorry, 54 normal control comparisons. You're looking down on the brain again, you're seeing excellent activation of those emotional control and regulation centers, orbital frontal cortex. This is the brain scan of Dante Page. And you don't need to be a brain imaging scientist to see that there's a difference there. He lacked very significantly frontal regulatory control over behavior. We took that to court and testified that he just didn't have the control over impulsive emotional behavior that the rest of us do. We added to that background psychosocial data, documentation of five admissions to emergency hospital in the first two years, vigorously shaken as an infant. Why? The grandmother testified because he cried. Severe physical and sexual abuse. He was taken to hospital with rectal bleeding at age 10 because he was being raped by the neighbor across the street. And of course, he was released from hospital to be raped again repeatedly by the neighbor across the street. Six inch scar on his back, still dark skin burns from the cigarette burns that he had. No supervision, raised in one of the very worst ghettos in the United States where every fifth house is either destroyed or has bullets in it. He's enuretic and encropetic until age 10. The teachers documented that this kid was severely disturbed right at first grade. He was referred eight times for treatment. He never received any treatment at all. He had low physiological arousal, which we've documented is one of the best replicated biological risk factors for antisocial behavior. So myself and the defense team argued teenage pregnancy, severe neglect, abuse, head trauma, no supervision, poor brain functioning in the prefrontal cortex, that critical area, low arousal. This is a walking machine for homicide. I mean, does this individual have responsibility? Did Dante Page ever ask to be brought up in this neighborhood with this brain? No, he didn't. So to what extent should he be punished? Well, the jury convicted him of first degree deliberate murder. They didn't buy this. The three judge panel in uh, Denver who decides whether he gets the death penalty bought this package. Rightly or wrongly, they bought into that package, spared him the death penalty. Now he's serving life in prison, so he's not getting away. But is that the right decision? Because if you buy into arguments like mine, isn't that a slippery slope down to an irresponsible society where there are excuses for all forms of behavior? All behavior has some causal determinants. Just because we know them, should that ever be an excuse for any behavior, especially horrendous behavior like this? That's the letter that Dante Page had read out at court. Look, I just like to go fishing. But all you see is a black man who killed a white woman. Nobody cares until I hurt someone. I never had a chance, and now it's over. And he's probably right on a lot of those things. So where at, at what point does mercy season justice? Quickly, another case study, Kip Kinkle. I'll be much quicker here. This was a boy at age 15 who killed his father and his mother and then went to school and killed two other school children and wounded 20 more. This is his brain scan. So you're looking upwards at the brain. This is not his brain, but just an anatomical rendering. And you're looking up at his brain. Uh, you, you know, if you slice his brain here, this is where his eyes would be. And what the neurologist testified at court is that he had very severe dysfunction, poor functioning in that orbitofrontal region, that same region of the brain. The, these aren't physically holes, it's a functional brain scan. So again, the same brain argument could apply to Kinko here. And if you look at his case, before the homicide, he was in therapy nine times with his mother for acting out. He had guns, knives, he had a problem with anger. He was put on Prozac for the depression that he also had. But he improved, and the mistake was, he was taken off the Prozac. 
None of us like medication to subdue aggressive behavior in children. None of us. But that was a mistake. He had a wonderful, loving father who was very responsible. He was a secondary school teacher. And you may think this is also a mis mistake, but during therapy, his father bought him a semi-automatic handgun. This was a Glock, which he also used in the killings. Before the killings, in English class, it was documented that he jumped up in class and shouted, God damn this voice in my head. Incidentally, why did he kill his parents? He claimed he had command hallucinations. He was commanded, kill your father, kill your mother, go to school and kill as many people as you could. It was documented by psychiatrists that he had rampant paranoid schizophrenia. He suffered from delusions. For example, one of his delusions was that China was going to take over the world, and he had explosives under the house to prepare for that. Now, the prosecution might argue, that's not a delusion. I mean, that's reality. I mean, this is 10 years ago in 1998. He's just perceptive in some way. But nobody countered the fact that he had severe mental illness. So the defense rejected the insanity defense. The defense decided, we're not pleading not guilty by reason of insanity. We'll plead our bargain with the prosecution. We'll get, have a 25-year concurrent sentence. So all the killings attempted killings, they'll run together, so he only serves 25 years in prison. The 25-year-old could get out at age 40. It's up to the judge to determine whether the sentences run consecutively or concurrently. And here's the issue that came up, and this is, I'm phasing into Stephen's talk in just a couple of minutes. There was a shift in the um, Oregon State Constitution just two years beforehand, which shifted the issue from principles of reformation to protect society, personal accountability. So Ju Judge Madison uh, made this statement. You know, to me, we have to protect society. Re you know, rehabilitation is one thing, but there's no guarantee in this case. So he sentenced Kinkle to 111 years in prison without ever the possibility of parole, making him the youngest person in Oregon serving a life sentence. And again, you could look at this in two ways. There's a right and a wrong here. We have to protect society. But can I ask you, do we think it's conceivable that the early predispositions early in life which constrain, Stephen will hate this, freedom of will, which constrains responsibility, and that's the dilemma. Now, if you want answers to moral dilemmas like this, I have a position, I'll take a stand. Stephen will give you his first and give a very firm and clear stand on these issues. That's just a summary of what I've described, but let me, at this point, turn over to Stephen. I think perhaps Rebecca may be introducing Stephen. Thank you very much for your patience and attention. <laughs>